Today we wanted to talk about steelhead with you, and that's mm -hmm. something that uh, is becoming more and more popular. There's no question about it. Um, Dick and I both like steelhead fishing because they're such an aggressive fish. I mean, quite honestly, when you get on good numbers of them, um, they're not difficult to catch. They're exciting when you hook one. They're in the air as much as they're in the water. Um, you know, the landed ratio is not very good. We figure that for every steelhead that we, that we hook, about 50% of them come to the boat. Uh, a lot of them are going to jump and get away or break you off. Um, it's all part of the game. But, man, I tell you what, when they, when they first strike, nothing pulls any harder than a steelhead. They are a rocket, and they're so much fun to uh, hook up into. Yeah, when they get uh, when they get going, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I kind of pulled this idea off your blog. So if people are looking for some more information on fishing and want to learn some stuff, you guys have an awesome blog uh, with a lot of really, really good information. And I, I saw this article and I thought it'd be really good because it's one of the things that we keep hearing from people walking around the show is, hey, uh, you guys want to talk about steelhead. So uh, it's it's called Downrigger Tricks for Steelhead. Um, can you kind of just lay out a little bit about what you talk about in that blog? Sure. Well, downriggers are deadly effective for steelhead, um, primarily because of the depth control. I mean, I think we all recognize that with the help of a, of a downrigger, you can put the lure that you're trying to fish in any depth that it has to be at. So, so that's important right there. Our basic setup, it, it starts with something called a fish flash. And if you haven't seen one, it's made by Yakma Bay Company. It's a triangle-shaped flasher. And we hook that on the end of our downrigger rod. And uh, I like the four inch ones. We don't need very big ones here. Our water's pretty clear here in the Great Lake. So a four inch one is adequate. And then on the back of that, we're going to add a fluorocarbon leader. And I usually go with about six foot of a 15 pound test. Then I'm going to add a ball bearing swivel. And then in the terminal end, I'm going to run a spoon. And I like uh, Wolverine Main Street spoons. I've uh, been using them for decades and we've had very, very good success with them. That system, when we drop it down on the downrigger, gives you a little bit more flash than just a traditional spoon would. So that fish flash is rotating, creating flash, bringing fish into the pattern. And then when they get close and they see that spoon, it is game on. Um, it really is a one-two punch that works exceptionally well uh, for triggering the steelhead into biting in open water environments where they are literally, um, you've got to pull them into your rig. They can be anywhere. So talk a little bit about that spoon, Mark, uh, the mini streak. Why why that spoon over some others? And uh, obviously a mini streak is going to have a certain size that's mini. Uh, why, why choose that size in that situation? Well, for those that might not be familiar with the mini streak, it's about a three-inch long spoon. So it's not a small spoon. It's not a standard size spoon. It's in between those two sizes. And the reason why we adapt to that is because um, steelhead have relatively small mouths. Um, they will, they are aggressive. They eat alewives, they'll eat smelt, they eat a wide variety of forked fish, um, but they can't eat those great big alewives. And so they're looking for things that are more in that two and a half, three and a half inch range. And, uh, and so when you match the hatch with a spoon that's that size, it seems like you do very, very well. Um, of course, we like Wolverine mini streaks also because of the color combinations available to them. Chip Cartwright's an old and dear friend of ours. Not many people are any more talented than Chip is at painting spoons, and so um, their finishes are impeccable. And of course, when we're fishing steelhead, it's really bright, gaudy stuff. We like oranges, we like pinks, chartreuses, really bright stuff seems to work the best on the steelhead. And how do you pair that color up with, with your, uh, your fish flash? Are you looking for comparative colors, contrasting colors? What does that look like? I like to match them up. That's a really good point, Chris. Um, I really like my flasher to be something in similar color to what my spoon is. So let's say, for example, I'm going to start out with a flasher that is um, chartreuse and silver. My spoon's going to have a lot of chartreuse and silver on it as well. Um, so we like to pair the colors. Uh, that way, if the color is not working, we can start switching colors and we, we can discern whether it's the flasher that's not working or the spoon that's not working. When you mix the colors, it becomes more difficult to determine that. So. Most of the time, we like to pair them up so that the flasher and the spoon are going to have similar color. You talked about swivels. Uh, how important is it to have a really good swivel when you're setting up something like this? Well, you know, it's, it's really kind of funny because people balk at buying a swivel. They have no problem spending $6 for a spoon. They have no problem spending $10 for a fish flash. They have no problem spending $1,500 for a can of downrigger. But when it comes to swivels, they balk at spending $3 for a quality swivel. And that's what gets the job done. If you don't have a ball bearing swivel on there, if you're using just a crane swivel, a traditional swivel, you're going to cut your bites in half because you're going to cut the action of your spoon in half. I think it's critically important. 
So you have to have a good ball bearing swivel and it doesn't need to be large. For steelhead, I recommend a size two. Um, if you go much larger than that, the weight of the, of the swivel is gonna impede on the, on the spoon itself and reduce the action of the spoon. So we like to keep our leaders relatively thin. 15 pound test is the heaviest that we would typically run. In a small swivel, that allows that spoon, which is in this case is a relatively small spoon, to have maximum action. Steel cutter, steelhead marker, kind of renowned for being all over in the water column. I mean, what's, you know, how, when you guys are targeting, you know, when you're specifically targeting steelhead, uh, how do you start that process? So where, where do you start the hunt for where you think those fish are going to be at any given day? Well, that's a good question. I think it really boils down to water temperature, and that's what a fish hawk is such a valuable tool for us. Well, I'll give you a, a real life example. Dick and I just filmed a show not too long ago on Lake Erie. It was in the middle of the summertime, so the surface water is like 75, 76 degrees. Way too warm for steelhead. I think we all agree on that. So you start dropping the fish hawk down and you're looking for temperature. You're looking for water that's below 60 degrees, ideally, is what you're looking for. Well, in the summer in Lake Erie, a lot of places, top to bottom is going to be 70 degree water. That's way too warm for steelhead, and so you won't find steelhead in those situations. So what we would do is move around with the fish hawk in the water, looking for what we describe as pockets of cool water. You know, you might go for a half a mile um, and have nothing but 70 degree water on the bottom, and then all of a sudden you hit a pocket of 55 degree water. When you hit that pocket of 55 degree water, it's game on. Those fish are going to be on. there. And they're going to be aggressive. Yeah. You would never know that. If you didn't have a fish hawk in the water, you would troll, you know, and maybe you go through and get a bite, save a waypoint, maybe come back and check that water, but you wouldn't know why those fish were there. And with the fish hawk, we can find those pockets of cool water and then concentrate on those pockets of cool water. It's a, you know, the way we look at it, we say this all the time. It means uh, sonar is important for us for marking fish, but if we didn't have a fish hawk, we wouldn't catch half the steelhead we catch. Mark, one of the other things you talked about fish hawk. Uh, there's another really great piece of technology on your boat when you're going after this. And that's the Canon Optimum Downrigger. And I know uh, one of the tactics that you're using there is using that downrigger to change your change your depth as you're trolling and, and kind of um, just kind of mixing things up. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, what you're referring to is a function on the rigger that's called the cycle mode. And basically what that does is we can set the rigger to be at any depth we want it to be. And then we can also set it so that it will periodically raise and lower the downrigger ball. What we generally do is we'll set it in an increment of about five seconds. And we'll also set it in an increment of about five feet. So if you can picture your downrigger ball at 50 feet down, after five seconds, it's going to cycle up to 45 down. Then it's going to cycle back down to 50 down again after five more seconds. And while this seems like a very small thing, it is not small. It's huge. What happens is that ball moves up and down in the water column, your spoon and your, and your flasher is also trailing it. And so what steelhead will often do is they'll get behind your presentation and they'll follow your presentation. They're interested, but they're just not interested enough to eat it. And all of a sudden that ball moves suddenly and that spoon jerks away from them. And it's just like taking a, you know, a ball of string away from a cat. They go crazy. They can't take that and it triggers strikes. That cycling mode is something we use primarily during the middle of the day when the bite is otherwise very slow. Steelhead are just like any other salmon. They're going to bite better in the mornings and evenings of low light conditions. But during the middle of the day when it slows down, that cycling mode uh, keeps those fish biting that we might not otherwise have caught. Um, if you don't have a cycle mode on your downrigger, if you're not lucky enough to have a, you know, an optimum can downrigger, what I would recommend doing is camping your butt out right next to the downrigger and every once in a while raising and lowering just running the switches. Sure. Yeah, I grew up being that guy in our house. We didn't have a remote control, <laughs> and I, I had to stand right by the TV and switch channels to my dad. That actually explains a lot. <laughs> you know, somebody's got to do that. So that's one of the things, like, you've got kids out there, and they're bored. That's a good job for them. To kind of incite some bites when you're out steelhead fishing. We've talked about three or four different methods. Is there something else that we haven't talked about that you guys use to, to create some more bites in the water? Yeah, it's called bottom track, and it's similar to the cycling mode, except for you can set your downward ball to be a certain distance away from the bottom. And then as the bottom contour naturally changes, the ball will track the bottom. Um, the way I describe this is kind of like a beagle following a, a rabbit track. Wherever that, you know, bunny goes, that beagle is going to follow. In this case, your downward ball is set to be, say, let's say three or four feet off the bottom if you're trying to target 
maybe brown trout, for example, or steelhead in this instance. Once that depth changes, um, that ball is going to track the bottom. And so it keeps you glued to the structure. Now, not always are steelhead structure already, and sometimes they're very pelagic and they can be anywhere in the water column. But in this instance, what I was just talking about, where we were on Lake Erie, all of these fish were tight to the bottom um, because that's where the temperature was. And so these features like, you know, cycling or bottom track uh, are invaluable. And uh, they're just not available on the average downward. Um, that's why we've kind of gravitated towards the cannon. Well, we really feel like it helps to catch more fish. And of course, it integrates very nicely with fish loss, so that works nicely for us as well. Uh, Jim says, uh, do you run that flasher at the ball or in line in front of the spoon like a dodger? Just like a dodger, except for a little bit, a little bit more space. When you're running a dodger, normally you're only running your, your presentation about 20 or 30 inches behind it. Um, when we're running this flasher, we're running it six foot back. So the flasher is on the end of your downrigger rod, six foot of fluorocarbon leading to your spoon. So the spoon and the flasher are six feet apart. And then I would normally run that flasher 25 um, to 40, maybe as much as 50 feet back behind the downrigger ball. Again, we're dealing with clear water. If I was fishing in, uh, in cloudy water, you know, very clear water conditions, I want that, that presentation to be further behind the downrigger ball. If the water was murky, I would run that whole rig as close as 20 feet to the downrigger ball. And I think that's one of the advantages of fish flash mark is, is it tracks straight so you can run that long lead and not tangle everything. Is that right? It does. Um, and the beauty of it is because it's spinning on its own axis, all it does is spin. Um, you don't have to worry about line twist or anything in that regard. Um, all it's doing is creating flash, um, which is, again, of course, it's pulling fish from a greater distance. And then once those fish get closer, they're more interested in the spoon than they are the fish flash at that point because, of course, the spoon is closely replicating food. And uh, we've been doing this for a long time now, and uh, I am amazed at how well that combination works. Every time we steelhead fish now, pretty much the same thing. Four-inch fish flash. That's the go-to rig. Mark, where are some of your favorite spots to go chase these steelhead? Well, the beauty of steelhead is that you can get them on all, uh, all five Great Lakes. But quite, quite honestly, the numbers are basically in two or three different locations. Um, Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and the, you know, the Wisconsin waters of Lake Michigan has got a huge steelhead presence. Um, amazingly great steelhead fishery there. That typically takes place in June. Um, Lake Erie, all summer long, can be extremely good on the Canadian side. Um, say from 4th of July all the way through August. Uh, on the Canadian side, we'd like the port of Wheatley. Um, if you go to Lake Ontario, um, well, you just can't beat the summertime steelhead fishery there. It's offshore at that time of year. It's going to be out in 300 feet of water or more, so you got to run a little bit offshore to find them. Um, but the port of Olcott is extremely good for steelhead. Um, you're going to have anywhere from 5 to 15 hookups a day there. So. Um, those three ports are some of our favorites. There's other good ones, but those are three of our favorites. And, uh, you know, everybody in this room is very excited about the upcoming season. Uh, we've had pretty unseasonably warm weather in the Great Lakes. Uh, a lot of these lakes that are typically frozen over this time of year are wide open, and people in this room are excited about getting out and going fishing. I'm sure you guys are getting ready and getting excited to go do some fishing. Uh, where are some destinations that you guys are headed out for early out of the season to do some filming for Fishing 411? I think probably one of the first places we'll end up is down in Michigan City at the southern end of Lake Michigan. And um, as you know, that's a good coho fishery. Those cohoes are down there all winter. Um, you get a mixture of other species. There'll be a few a Chinook in the mix. There'll be a few lake trout in the mix. Maybe even a lake trout or, or excuse me, a brown trout or two. So that's high on my list. And the reason we like it is because it's close to shore. So, as you know, the weather in the spring is pretty unpredictable, a lot of wind. Um, Michigan City is so close that you're fishing normally close enough to the shore you can throw a baseball and hit the beach. So you can get out even when it's windy at Michigan City. So that's probably going to be one of our first places we hit this year. If people want to watch Fishing 411 TV, Mark, where's the best place for them to catch the show? Now, if they don't have it on the cable or satellite as far as the Sportsman's Channel or World Fishing Network, um, what I would recommend is a couple of on-demand places. Of course, um, we have our own YouTube channel, so you can go to Fishing 401 YouTube, watch the shows there free of charge. You can also see them at MyOutdoorTV.com. Uh, and Outdoor America um, is also offering this stuff as well now, so uh, you have uh, those options as well. Anything else for Mark, Trevor? No, it's good. I mean, steelhead are probably my favorite fish. I mean... I mean, every you know, kings get all the attention, you know, but 
man, it's it's hard to it's they're psycho. I mean, they're, it's hard to beat a <laughs> it's hard to beat a good steely bite. It's a it's a fun fight. Yeah, appreciate you taking some time out here on your Saturday to stop and talk with us. Chris, thank you very much. And Trevor, you're right, steelhead are psycho. That's the perfect description. They are. Psycho. They are. <laughs> There's psycho. Yeah. All right, Mark Romanek from Fishing Four One One TV.